Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Polly and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Oh, my favorite town. Uh, <laughs> Uh, by God's grace, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since April the 11th of 1977, and for that I am eternally grateful. I have a home group, and that's the third legacy group in Bellingham, Washington. I have a sponsor, and her name is Dottie H., and those are the three things that I need to be a member in good standing in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> I want to thank Marina for inviting me, and John, Marina and John. I don't know where they are, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I know that uh, Dick and Clancy are just ecstatic to be here, but I have really good reasons when I get to come to Chicago. They are so good. And uh, that is that I get to hang out in some fabulous AA meetings, the Fox Hall Group, the California Group, the Evanston Group, and I have so much fun doing that, but there's really something special, really, really special, and it's Ryan, Chris, and Maddie, and, uh, and that, uh, <clears throat> I will embarrass you, the, tra- <laughs> the traditions reader is my son, James, so, yeah, isn't that cute? <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter-in-law Kelly's here, and some sponsees of mine are here tonight, and I am so excited to be here, and I'm so excited for your first ever conference. Fabulous. And uh, gosh, first time out of the shoot, look how well you guys did. Give yourself a hand. This is fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> Uh, I met Dick. I haven't ever met uh, Dick and his wife, Linda. I believe that was correct. I hope I'm right. And uh, I was so excited to meet them and looking forward to hearing him talk on Sunday. And uh, I'm extremely honored to be here with Clancy. Uh, I lived in Southern California for 21 years. And, uh, and I have had the privilege of being at a lot of meetings with Clancy. And I always feel extremely privileged to be able to be at a conference where he's at. And the thing about it is, it's sometimes it's kind of bad when we're both talking at the same conference because I quote him constantly. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, and uh, I don't know what to tell you, Clance, except you just, you know, you throw out some good stuff and I just happen to catch it. So, uh, at any rate, I'm just thrilled to death to be here, so thank you so much. Uh, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that I should share in a general way. What it used to be like, what happened, and what I'm trying to be like today, and I'm going to do that to the, to the best of my ability. Uh, first, I want to tell you that my husband says to tell all of you that he sends his best. He sent me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really something. All weekend, that, that I got here on Wednesday, and I went to the Foxhall group on Wednesday night, and everybody was there, you know, and I got there, and I got all that loving that you get there. And then the next words out of their mouth is, where's Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so I have to let him know that he was really missed. The other thing is, is my phone is on silent, and I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, when I was 60 years old, I'm past that a few years now, but when I was 60 years old, my husband gave me a fantastic watch and I can't see it. So I'm here to use this for the timer. So um, I want to start off by telling you that I'm living, breathing proof that you can come to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and be a real alcoholic and not come from the disease of alcoholism. I do not come from the disease of alcoholism. Now, I've heard in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous shaken up an alcoholic's family tree and an alcoholic will fall out. And if that's the truth, it very possibly could have been 
my grandfather, my mother's mother. However, I do not believe that's true. Because I, the only reason I can say that is that he was the only one in our family who drank. Because the rest of us, uh, the, were, we were really staunch Southern Baptists, and we didn't drink. And so consequently, I grew up with the deal, thou shalt not drink. And uh, my daddy died when he was 60 years old, and he had 60 years of sobriety. My mother is 86 years old, and she has 86 years of sobriety. <laughs> my mother is not the least bit impressed with my 27 years of sobriety. <laughs> Her deal is that if you'd have just never drank, those things would have never happened to you anyway. So. And I'm not going to say that this was beaver cleaver. You know, it was not, there was, there was certainly things going on. And thanks to inventory, I am so grateful for the inventory steps because I've learned so much about myself and I've learned because of those steps, I've learned about my parents. And one, what I have learned about my parents is both of my parents were abused children. And I guess it's like an alcoholic and an Al-Anon. They just found each other. And what happened was, is what they did is they tried everything they knew how to do to make me feel good about myself. And when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and you gave me the steps, I learned why I never could feel good about myself no matter what they did. And the reason is, is because I've learned you cannot give that what you do not have. And my parents never had that themselves. Uh, what I know today is that I was a very loved child. Uh, there's a book out called How It Worked, and it's about Clarence Snyder's life. And the author of that book talks about, he says, there seems to be two characteristics that cause alcoholism, and that's being loved too much or not enough. And if that's the case, I was loved too much because my parents tried everything they could and to love me, and they were not wealthy, but what they did are far from wealthy. My mother, I was a latchkey kid before it was popular because that my mother worked. And uh, most mothers, when I, back when I was a little girl, they didn't work. It was a very unusual thing. So my mother worked. But what they did is they tried to give me all the things that I wanted to do. And they provided me with those. And I know today that that was a huge sacrifice for them. Yet they never acted like it was a sacrifice. The other thing is, is I am an only child. And what I did is what happened for me was my parents adored me. They would have done anything for me. And still to this day, nothing has changed. But the deal was, as I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I would have sworn to you that nobody loved me. Because that's the way I felt. I felt as if nobody loved me. And thanks to the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in this loving program, I have found out what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me is I have a spiritual illness, and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritual solution. I am suffering. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I am suffering from a spiritual malady. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I am separated from the sunshine of the Spirit. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that if I am suffering from a spiritual malady, nothing is enough. You cannot love me enough. You cannot give me enough. You cannot do enough. There simply is not enough for an alcoholic like me. I am so grateful today that I know what's wrong with me. And what's wrong with me is the disease of alcoholism. And the big book tells me that I am suffering from an illness that is hopeless of mind and body. But because of a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I live a life today beyond my wildest dreams. Beyond my wildest dreams. I am busier today in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous than I have ever been. I sponsor more people than I have ever sponsored, and I'm into more service than I've ever been into. And there's a really good reason. I love my life. I love my life. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And at 27 years, I have so much to learn this. I have so much to learn this. And it is a privilege. It is a privilege to get to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. It is an absolute privilege. But <clears throat> I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I knew about God. I had heard about God all my life. Now, one of the things that I love, and there's not anybody I sponsor that does not get this tape, <clears throat> and the tape is Clancy's tape on alcoholism, a disease of perception. Because today I know that I have a disease of perception. I don't perceive things the way they really are. My perception of reality is distorted. I absolutely cannot see the truth. I know today it doesn't matter that I have been in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous I haven't had any alcohol or any of those funny little tablets that I used to take. And yet, I still need you today more than I have ever needed you. I need you today because I need you to keep me in touch of reality and keep me in touch with reality. And one of the things that I love, it seems like the longer I'm sober, the less I know. And I love that because... I, I hope I never get to a place that I'm not teachable. I hope that I always remain teachable because if I remain teachable, that I can learn more. I had a wonderful, wonderful day today with my daughter-in-law, and she helped me see some things that I haven't seen before. And I'm so grateful for that. Anything that I can, any way that I can grow but if I don't stay open and allow you to teach me, then I don't get to grow. And gosh, I could have missed it. I could have missed it. And that's the miracle of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, when I was going to this Baptist church, I know today that my perception of that Baptist church is what the problem is because my mother doesn't feel anything about that Baptist church I feel. She doesn't see it any way the way I saw it. But what I saw was, is I saw these preachers stand up behind a podium and they'd slam their fist on the podium and their faces would get red and their veins would stick out and they'd lean into the congregation and they'd say things like, if you thought it, you've done it. Now, <laughs> you guys must have been alcoholics who thought a lot too. <laughs> Because I was an alcoholic in the making, and I thought a lot. <laughs> and I just knew that my feeling of God was that God wanted to kill me. I mean, I was just this awful, sinning person who was going to burn in hell. And I, had, I was just hopeless. I was just a little girl who was very, very hopeless. And I'm so grateful today for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because I can remember when I grew up, my mother used to use the term, and I know that she didn't mean this in a negative way. She meant it in a loving way. But what I did is I took it totally out of context. And my mother used to say, we live in a God-fearing home. Well, I'm here to tell you I live in a God-loving home. And it's fabulous, fabulous. When, uh, <clears throat> when I was 18 years old, I married an Air Force officer. And I just knew that I had found my knight in shining armor and we were going to sail off into the sunset and live happily ever after. Now, what I have learned about myself through the marvelous steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, particularly the fourth and fifth, is I have never been a person who wants to be responsible for myself. And the truth known is, is I still don't. But I belong to this fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I work these 12 steps, and I work the traditions and the concepts, and what those steps tell me that I have to do is be responsible and accountable for my actions past and present. And I've never wanted to do that. Now, if you pout 
in Texas, we call it puffing up. I was just in Texas, and somebody was talking about puffing up. Oh, it was fabulous. I just love to hear these little things that I, that I hear when I go back home. And, you know, puffing up is when you just kind of puff up. And if somebody asks you, what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> but the truth is, is that if you don't make me feel better, then you don't love me. And I love what Clancy says. Clancy says that we're people who have to be treated special just to feel average. And if you don't treat us special, then we feel rejected. And I understood that. And that was what was with me. Here I had married this man. And what I had married is this man was in SAC, the Strategic Air Command. I don't even know if it's around anymore. I don't think it is. I think they call it something else. And this man is going to be gone, and he's going to be gone for years at a time. And I'm going to have to learn to be responsible for myself. And I've never wanted that. See, my head tells me that if I have money, men, and mansions, I'm going to be fabulous. <laughs> and the other thing is, is I'm southern born and raised. And, of course, if you're southern born and raised, men were put on earth to take care of women. That's the, that's the rule. <laughs> And now here I married this man who is going to be gone for years at a time. And let me just tell you how, I don't know about your denial, but I can just feel like, <clears throat> I can feel like I'm not in denial. And we were, we were sitting talking, James and Kelly, one day, and we were talking about Kelly's mom having to have been a single parent and how that had, you know, how hard that was. And I said, Oh, that must have been just terrible to have to be a single parent. And James looks at me and says, well, Mom, you were. I said, I wasn't a single parent. You had a dad. He said, yeah, but he was never home. And, you know, I never even realized that. And it really gets a little nastier as we go through my story because I've got some really messed up kids, and he wasn't ever there. I was the only present parent. <laughs> You know, don't start feeling sorry. <laughs> Amazing. It's just like, ding, it's gone. Anyway, <clears throat> I am a person who has always felt that I was not enough. And uh, I did some work with my daughter-in-law today. She's a therapist, and it was just so much fun to do this. And I've always had this feeling. And it's, you know, 27 years later, and I still have it. You know, and it's just like, is that ever going to go away? And, but I've always had this feeling that I'm just not enough. And, uh, and I had that feeling at 18 years old. Now, I am uneducated. I am still uneducated. I don't have a college education. And something inside of me said, you're stupid. You can't go to school. You better get married and find somebody to take care of you or you're, you know, you'll never be able to take care of yourself. This was the kind of thing that went through me. I was not capable of doing that. Those feelings of being inadequate. Well, I've learned a lot of truth about myself. I used to say, well, I'm stupid because I've never been to college. Well, the deal is, is I've found out some truth about myself. I've always wanted those letters after my name. I have just never wanted to go to school. <laughs> and I felt that way <clears throat> at 18 years old. And I get this invitation in the mail, and it's from the base commander's wife. And I have been invited to attend this coffee. And I am, I am absolutely terrified because I am so scared to go to this coffee and I'm so overwhelmed with feelings of intimidation because how am I going to go to this coffee when all of these women are there and they're educated and they're sophisticated and I'm none of those things. How will I ever interact with these women? And so we go to the coffee and here's all us little second lieutenant's wife sitting out here and the base commander's wife standing up much like I am tonight. And she's telling all of us little new little uh, second lieutenant's wives what we're going to do to enhance our husband's career. 
how we're going to have the right dinner parties, how we're going to attend the right functions, all these things that we're going to do. We're going to dress properly. We're going to wear the right length gloves, all these things that we're going to do. And I think, I can't do this. I can't. There is no way that I can be with these people. They're way too sophisticated for me. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, they had a luncheon, of which, of course, we're expected to attend. And I attended that luncheon. And at that luncheon, I had took a drink of alcohol. And I took a drink of sherry. Now, I don't remember any fantastic things happening. I don't remember, you know, all of a sudden, I'm Rita Hayworth. Some of you are way too young to understand who that is. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I didn't get that kind of feeling. But what happened was, is I just felt like I could breathe. I just took a drink of alcohol, and I felt like I could breathe. And I had no idea what alcohol was doing to me. But I could guarantee you what it was doing for me. It allowed me to attend these functions that I had to attend or was expected to attend. And if I took a drink of alcohol, I could nod in the right places. I could laugh in the right places. I seemed to be able to handle social situations which ordinarily terrified me so badly that I didn't want to be in those situations. Along about 1962, we're stationed in a place called Loring Air Force Base, Maine. And uh, <clears throat> this, pla uh, this is like really cold. It's the very tippy top of Maine. I've got two little boys. I have no idea how to take care of these two little boys. I haven't had parenting 101. I certainly don't know what to do with them. I can't send them out to play because it's 50 below zero. And these two little boys are driving me crazy. And I'm having a nervous breakdown every 20 minutes. And I went to an Air Force doctor, and they said, take these. And from 1962 until 1977, when I entered the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I took Librium and Valium and Secanol and Nimutol and drank alcohol. Now, I'm here to tell you that if you, t if you take those kind of drugs, and drink alcohol, you are not an active alcoholic. <laughs> I call myself a couch potato alcoholic. I did my dying on my living room sofa. I just laid there and watched soap operas and listened to Joan Baez sing the blues. <laughs> Uh, there's a chapter in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that's really precious and dear to me, and that's the chapter of the family afterwards. And uh, it means a lot to me because uh, one of the things that I've learned, it says that anybody, in that chapter it says that anybody who lives with a practicing alcoholic is affected by the disease of alcoholism. And one of the things that's really clear to me is that the disease of alcoholism traumatizes children. Children are in a battleground and don't even know how they got there. And my children have been traumatized by a disease called alcoholism. Today, a mother like me would not be allowed to keep her children because I am a mother who has abused my children in every way. I have spiritually, emotionally, physically abused my children. And most of all, what I did was absolute, blatant neglect. I simply could not take care of my children. I have been so grateful. We were talking tonight at dinner about when you come to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you can just do what you're told to do. And it doesn't sound like it'll make any sense. I mean, I don't know how you felt, but I just thought, oh my God, this is too lame for words. It's just, I mean, how could this work? But what I'm so grateful is that I was so desperate to be sober. And that's something else. I hope you're desperate. 
I hope you're out of ideas. I hope you have no more left. I mean, one more good idea, and I, an alcoholic like me would be dead. You know, I just hope you're out of good ideas. But I was so willing to take direction. And I took direction to a, from a sponsor, and I believed no way would it work. And what he told me was, when I got through with my fifth step, and my first AA sponsor was a man. And uh, I hear, you know, I believe that, you know, men sponsor men and women sponsor women. But one of the things that happens is my first AA sponsor was a man. And it was exactly what I needed. My first AA sponsor <clears throat> was a Monsignor priest. He was a captain in the Navy. He was an only child. And what happened was, is Frank was able to give me what I needed to hear. And he was able to tell me the truth. And he could tell me the truth with so much love that I could hear him. I could hear him. I love what Scott R. says. He talks about the, the knife of reality and truth with the anesthetic of love. And I needed the truth. I absolutely needed the truth. And Frank looked at me and he said, Polly, you are a child of this man. And he said, you are going to go to those boys and you're going to make amends. And what I want you to do is, he said, those boys are going to have a lot to say to you. And what I want you to do is I don't want you to say things like, you shouldn't feel that way. I'm sober today. What I want you to do is just say, I'm so sorry that happened to you, and I'll spend the rest of my life being the very best mom I can be. In that chapter, it talks about that we will scarcely even the score in this life. So my deal is to be the very best mom I can be, one day at a time. And when I got through, my sons were 14 and 16 years old when I got sober. And I'm here to tell you, they were angry. They were very angry. They were tired of seeing, trying to bring friends home and seeing their mother passed out on the floor. They were tired of me showing up at their hockey games drunk. They were tired of having car wrecks in the car with me because I was drunk. My sons were angry. And by God's grace and good sponsorship direction, I did what I was told. And I'm telling you today, I have a relationship with my sons that is beyond my greatest expectation. This program works. It absolutely works. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you a bunch of gory stories that happened in Alcoholics Anonymous because I slept through it. <laughs> I, had, I had all my affairs sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> So, what I'd like to do is tell you how I got here. I had a car wreck in Irving, Texas, right where the Dallas Cowboys play football. I'm a blackout drinker, and from the best that I can understand that I did in Texas, they have these turnarounds. They're right by viaducts where you can turn around and get back up on the freeway. And the best I can understand that I figured out is I tried to make one of those and <laughs> hit the... Hit the, hit the viaduct, and I told an automobile. Well, I got out of my car. I'm just so smart. I got out of my car and walked to a phone booth and called the police and told them that my car had been stolen. And here comes the police with my husband, and I'm taken to the Irving police station. And I get to see that look on the non-alcoholic's face that just doesn't understand why we do the things we do. And this policeman just looked at my husband with so much disgust, and he said, why don't you just take her home and sober her up? And on the way home, he says, Polly, there's a treatment center, and it's not far from our house, and I wish you would go. And that night, I entered treatment for the first time. Now, this was not a fancy jitter joint. This was a county detox. And uh, I entered this treatment center, <clears throat> and they started taking us to a lot of AA meetings, and I fell in love with the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I fell in love with the laughter. I fell in love with the fellowship. But there was just something down deep inside of me 
that said, Polly, people like you just don't become alcoholics. Dr. Tebold says that there's two characteristics found in every alcoholic. Grandiosity and defiant individuality. <laughs> My husband says only an alcoholic can lay in the gutter feeling superior to those looking down. <laughs> People like me don't become alcoholics. And uh, while I was in this treatment center, I had a Jenner House romance. You know, where sick falls in love with sick and walks off into happy destiny. <laughs> We walked off into happy destiny for 58 days. <laughs> and I was brought back into that treatment center more dead than alive. And I had been beaten up in numerous and sundry other things. And I'd reached that place in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that talks about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Because now I knew what the problem was. The problem was sobriety. On that tape, I told you that Clancy has out called Alcoholism, a Disease of Perception. Clancy talks about the disease of alcoholism. And he was the first person that talked about it. It seemed like, again, my perception. It seemed like everywhere I went, I heard people talk about they came into AA and they got the wife back, the car back. Life was fabulous. What I was experiencing is I got sober and I felt worse. I felt horrible. I didn't understand that the 12 steps and the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts were going to make me feel differently than I felt. The only thing I knew is that right now I can't live, so I can't live sober inside my own skin. I can't live sober because sober... I know what kind of mom I am. Sober, I know what kind of daughter I am. I know what kind of wife I am. I know what I've done sober. And I've heard in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that men hate what, men hate what they've done and women hate what they have become. And I hated what I had become. And I knew that there was no way I could live sober. And when that seven-day detox was up, I left that treatment center. And uh, and I got a bottle of scotch, and I got a bottle of Valium, and I checked into a motel. I don't believe that there's anybody in this room that doesn't have an angel in their life, someone who leads us to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had such a person in my life, and she knew nothing about the disease of alcoholism, but she loved me. And she said that day that something came over her. And today I know that something was God working in my life through her. And she drove around until she found my car parked outside this motel. And I had just barely shut the door. It wasn't closed all the way. And she pushed it open. And she found me, she found me laying there. And on April the 8th of 1977, I was pronounced dead on arrival in a hospital in Bedford, Texas. Needless to say, that didn't take because I'm standing here tonight. <laughs> I'd just like to tell you about the miracle of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, today I cannot believe that that was that person because I love my life so much today. I love every breath I take today. And it seems like the longer I'm here, the better it gets. I just love my life. But in that day, I was so desperate. I was so desperate I couldn't live. I believe that I am here by God's grace. I believe that I have been given the grace of God, his love, his free gift. There's a writing in our daily reflection that says that sobriety is God's gift to me. What I do with my gift is my gift back to God. There is nothing, that I could, I, there is nothing that's too much for me to do in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I will do whatever I can because I know that it's this beautiful program that has given me the life that I have today. I have been given the gift of grace. So many people come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and they get the gift. There's nothing any different from me than there is for the guy that's laying out in the street tonight on Michigan Avenue. There's no different. 
We're the same. We're the same kind of alcoholic. It's just that I was given the gift, and I kept it. But most people lay it back in the seat and turn around and go out. I'm so grateful today for the gift of sobriety. What happened for me is the state of Texas in 2004, I mean, two, two, today is 2004. <laughs> it's no different than it was in 2004. In 1977, they do not take kindly to you trying to commit suicide. So I was put on one of those wonderful little 72-hour holes, and I was sent to a psychiatric hospital. It was just enough time for my husband to obtain a court order that, I was, that said that I was a detriment to myself and, I was, and others, a detriment to myself and others, and I was court committed to treatment. <clears throat> I entered that treatment center on April the 11th of 1977, and by God's grace in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since. <clears throat> on page 164 in A Vision for You, it says, If our relationship with him is right, then great events will come to pass. That's the fact, the great fact for us all. And what I'd like to do is uh, I have about 15 or 20 minutes, and I'd like to share with you my great events that have come to pass. I have been loved no matter what in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wanted to be loved so desperately. And what I found out is I've always been loved. The only person who has never been on my side was me. That's the only person who's never been on my side is me. And what I did is I looked for love in all the wrong places. Because you see, I hadn't, fa I haven't, ha didn't, haven't had the opportunity. I didn't know enough about God to fill that very special hole with God's love. So what I did is I started looking for love in relationships and sex, and I started trying to get that from other men in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I will guarantee you, I was not a program of attraction, or certainly not the kind that you'd want to be attracted to. I often say, you know how the girls now wear, show their belly and wear these short uh, shirts and stuff? Well, I'm here to tell you that I used to show up in meetings with halter tops, hip hugger shorts, two long red ponytails. I mean, I look just like Daisy May. <laughs> and, you know, whatever walked through the door that I thought was cute and desirable, I was running up to him saying, Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> you look like you got what I want. <laughs> Needless to say, I had to hit a bottom in sobriety that was really devastating because. Uh, you know, you just can't, you can't act out and behave like that and do very well in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was an attraction. I wasn't. This is a spiritual program. And there was nothing I was doing that was spiritual. I'm so grateful that people lovingly told me what I was doing. And just like if I were a drinking alcoholic, just kept saying, Polly, keep coming back. Just keep coming back. Um, I was told to get busy in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was told if you have 15 minutes, share that 15 minutes with a newcomer. I was told, you know, start making coffee, start sweeping the floor, start doing things in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got sober in Texas. And Texas is really strong with sponsorship. And it's really strong with service. And the thing that I was told to do, because I was quick. I mean, I couldn't have sat down and read the big book. I didn't have a tension span that would have read the big book. But I could sweep floors. I could make coffee. I could do the things that took some action. Just get busy. Do things in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what I began to do. And as the time went on, I got better and better. And I continued to show up for meetings. And one of the things that I've learned 
is that I have a spiritual illness. And what happens is that in order to heal a spiritual illness is I have to reach out and help somebody else. That's what I have to do. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I need to have constant thoughts of others. And I've been told many times, Polly, what is it about that you don't understand? (laughs) You see, my problem is me, about thinking about me. And I think one of the things that happens when we get with psychiatrists and psychologists is they really think they're helping us, but they tell us things like, you need to do that for yourself. Well, I'll tell you, doing it for myself got me a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't until I started doing it for you. And what I've learned is, is if I reach out and help you, what I do is it comes back and I help me. One of the things that kind of gives me the shivers a little bit, and I'd just get, like to give you another way to think about it, is a lot of times in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous I hear, you know, just suit up and show up for meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and let us love you till you can love yourself. I'd just like to say just a little different twist on that. Why don't you come into the room, suit up and show up for, Alco- for Alcoholics Anonymous and let us love you until you can love somebody else. Because the magic here is to be able to reach out and help another person. That's the magic. That's the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. It doesn't seem like that's what ought to work. What ought to work is me to sit down and you do it for me. But you see, I'm suffering from a spiritual malady. And the way I'm going to heal is to reach out and help another person. I am a person who sponsors a lot of people. And I am blessed to sponsor these women. I don't have a clue what I do for them. I don't have a clue. But I can guarantee you, I couldn't make it without them. I need them. Because you see, what happens is, as they can call me up, and whatever their problem is, it's amazingly worse than mine. And I just listen to their problem, and mine doesn't have any, I mean, it just went away. It's gone. And what happened is, is I got out of me for a few minutes. And I'm a person who has had a lot of depression in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I I would get my hands on everything I could about Bill W. because he had suffered so much depression. And in 1989, I was handed a gift. And that gift was the language of the heart. And I am so grateful because in there it talks about our next frontier, emotional sobriety. And one of the things it talks about is the way we can stop hanging on to faulty dependencies is to reach out and the very best way is to reach out and help another alcoholic. <clears throat> when I got sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was married. And uh, I had been married for 19 years, and at three years of sobriety, my husband and I divorced. And I ended up marrying another member of this fellowship. And uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our marriage. And one of the things is, is that Dave and I fell in love with each other. And I did not have any hanky-panky with Dave. But Dave sponsored a lot of people that I had hanky-panky with. (laughs) And and he knew more about me than he needed to. He didn't need to know all that. And Dave and I have often said, if we'd have known we were going to get married, we'd have never told each other the things we told each other. But um, Dave said to me, when I was three and a half years sober, he says, Polly, I'm in love with you, but you need to get something straight. I don't want to have an affair with you. I want to marry you. And you see, things like that aren't supposed to happen to people like me. And uh, you know, God willing and the creek don't rise, On October the 27th, Dave and I will be married 24 years. And that is not bad. (laughs) Thank you. Now that's two alcoholics hooked up together. 
What an order. I can't go through with it. <laughs> but Dave and I wanted to be married, and we wanted to stay married, because I'm Dave's fourth wife. And as one of our wonderful Al-Anon ladies likes to constantly remind Dave, is that he is the only common denominator in all those marriages. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm of the suffering type. I was married for 22 years. So neither one of us knew how to have a marriage, but both of us knew how to take a hostage. And what we wanted was to have a marriage, and we wanted to stay married. But we didn't know how to have a marriage. We didn't know how to do it. So what we began to do is we began to ask some people how to have a marriage. And my first AA sponsor had left the priesthood and married a Taiwanian woman. And he said, Polly, you and Dave plant yourself firmly in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you take this program, you take the steps and the traditions and the concepts, and you water it just like you nurture yourself, just like you would nurture those trees. And he says, and just like those oak trees, they'll grow firm and straight. And one day you'll look up and you can't tell where one begins and the other ends. And he says, and that's what happens in marriage. And uh, I am also in the program of Al-Anon. And my Al-Anon sponsor before Albert died six years ago, her and Albert would have been married 50 years. And they had a marriage like I wanted. They had a love affair. And if, if Sally and I would go to a woman-to-woman -woman where she was the Al-Anon speaker and I was the AA speaker, she'd open up her suitcase and she'd have all these little love notes in it. And I wanted that. I wanted to be married nearly 50 years and have a love affair. That's what I wanted. And we sat down with Albert and Sally one day and they said there's some magic words. And those magic words are, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And you know what the biggest secret of all is? You don't really have to be the one who's wrong. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I make amends whether they're real or fancy. And I didn't know that. And I, there's a wonderful man. He's the finest man I have ever, ever known. And his name was Frank Honeycutt. And he died last July the 30th. And Frank used to say, Darling, do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? And I loved him for that because he always just got right to me. <clears throat> and then Dave and I met this couple down in, Ob in Omaha, Dick and Peggy. And Dick and Peggy were talking about working the traditions in their relationship. And they sat down one afternoon and told Dave and I how to do that. And Dave and I picked up the traditions and worked them in our relationship. Now, <clears throat> it hasn't been a rose garden. Dave and I have been married 24 years. Dave's sober 28 years. I'm sober 27 years. And life's been in session. Life has absolutely been in session. But the deal is, is that we've been able to do life on life's terms. And Dave and I have been able to suit up and show up for life. <clears throat> One of the things that happened when we first got married is uh, we had stepchildren. That'll, you know, that'll put a little strain on a marriage, especially a dope-smoking, alcoholic, <laughs> drug-taking <laughs> stepchild. <laughs> we had three of those. We had three like that. And uh, we had a child who had grave emotional and mental disorders. Three of them were alcoholic and drug addicts, and one had grave emotional and mental disorders kids, worried about the kids. Uh, Dave and I seemed like that, that kind of stuff was kind of, you know, coming together, and then lo and behold, things are rocking along really good, and uh, we're living in Southern California, and we're doing the good life. Things are great. We got a nice house out in Fountain Valley, and the bottom fell out of aerospace. And Dave lost his job. And we didn't think that, you know, much about that. For God, you know, for goodness sakes, Dave is a computer scientist. He'll find a job. I mean, that's never been his problem. And uh, but you know, the world wasn't looking for a 57-year-old computer science scientist in 1993. And Dave really did not work again to a job that paid any money for two years. 
and he worked two minimum wage jobs. And we had a really nice house, and my job, I couldn't, I couldn't float our boat. And we ended up losing our home. And we ended up going through the most <coughs> shameful period of my sobriety. And Dave's too. Both of us. But he can speak for himself. But both of us were horrified. Because we ended up having to foreclose on our house. Our whole block was up for sale. You could not sell your house. We gave that house away for less money than we owed. And what happened was we ended up having to have that house foreclosed on. And we ended up filing bankruptcy. And I'm like, I can't do this. And I'm a wonderful AA sponsor, and she has been through so much adversity in her life. And she just kept saying, Polly, God will take care of it. God will take care of it. You know, you're just, your job is just to keep telling the truth. And I felt like, well, I don't need to tell that. You know, <laughs> we don't need to tell that. And she says, you need to tell the truth. And uh, Frank Honeycutt used to say, I used to say, what are people going to think? They're going to, you don't, that's, you don't file bankruptcy in Alcoholics Anonymous. What are people going to think? And Frank he said to me, sweetheart, he said, it's none of your business what people think of you. But your very life depends on what you think of them. And you just go do what Dottie told you to do and tell the truth. And, uh, and we've told the truth. And uh, we've learned a lot from that experience. And one of the things that I've learned is, is that I'm not so spiritual that I ever want that to happen again. <laughs> I'm, I like my life much better the way it is today. <clears throat> November a year ago, Dave and I lost one of our children. And uh, Dave's son, Mike, was 42 years old, and he died of lung cancer. And he was nine years old. But you know, God is there because what happened is it seems like when God shuts a door, he opens another. Sometimes I think he shuts a window and opens huge doors. But uh, Mike, wasn't, Mike wasn't leaving, and it was just the, the hospice nurse. Dave was there. The family was there. But Mike's sister hadn't arrived, and uh, the hospice nurse said he's waiting on somebody. And uh, just minutes before he had to finally let go, Kim came in the room. Dave had not seen Kim in 15 years, nor had he talked to her, because Kim was living on the streets of Denver, doing what women have to do to support an alcohol and crack habit. And Kim walked in that room, and she was eight months sober. Great events come to pass, and on March the 10th, of 2000 and, uh, 2003, Dave was able to give his daughter a one-year cake at the Monday night Seal Beach Speakers Meeting. Great events will come to pass. And the beautiful thing is, is all our kids are home. They're all home. I want to just quickly tell you about my two sons. When I was six and a half years sober, my 14, uh, when I was six and a half years sober, my son came to me. He, was, he started at 14. He wasn't 14 then. He came to me and he said, Mom, I want what you have. And six and a half years before, he did not want what I had. Six and a half years before, I was supposed to attend a function at his school. And he said, Don't you dare show up at my school because I am ashamed of you. And six and a half years later, he wants what I have. I'm telling you, there was nobody in Evanston, Illinois, that was as happy as me on January the 11th at the Evanston Group when we were there celebrating James's 20th AA birthday. Great events will come to pass. Great events. And James is married to Kelly. And in July, Kelly will be 15 years old. And James and Kelly have three children. And uh, I wish you could just, if you don't know them, I wish you could see what you've done for them. James and Kelly have been relieved of the bondage of self. And they know how to be parents. I can remember about ten and a half years ago, or ten, maybe nine and a half years ago, and it was Thanksgiving. And we had just found out, we had, Ryan just didn't respond like Ryan was supposed to. 
and uh, we'd done some tests, and we found out Ryan was profoundly deaf. And we sat there, and we didn't get it. We didn't get it. I have never been so angry at God. I had my fist at God. I don't know what they did. And we sat there, and we didn't understand it. How could this be fair? People have babies all the time, and they don't even want them. And they're born perfect. And here's our baby, and he's born deaf. And we don't get it. We didn't get it. But you see, one more time, our perception of reality is distorted. Because we never knew what this little boy was going to teach us. Hadn't a clue what this little boy was going to teach us. You want to know about courage? Ryan's 11 years old, just turned 11, just turned 11, May the 23rd. He is going into junior high school, and he has been totally integrated into public school since he was in kindergarten. Kindergarten. He is the only deaf child in his school. Talk about being different. But let me tell you something. He doesn't know he's different. His parents go up to the school and they teach the kids to sign. And you watch the kids talk to Ryan and they sign. And the other thing is, is this child is handicapped in no way. He is in the middle of his class and he's deaf. Talk about courage. And we have Chris and Matt. Great events will come to pass. And that's AA. That's what AA does. And these kids have suited up and showed up. And it's wonderful because now they're getting to have fun at AA. Because the kids got a little bigger so they can start doing all the stuff they do. So now there are meetings popping up all over Evanston. And it's fun. Back in the fellowship. But being able to be the parents and be responsible for the precious cargo. My oldest son, I probably understood more than anyone else because Russ has always tried to hurt himself. And I understood that because I did that. I would cut on myself or try to hurt myself in some way because it just seemed like I couldn't bear emotional pain. And, uh, and that's what my son Russ did. And my son Russ while I was sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, tried to take his life six times. And there were times I thought, I just can't stand this. I absolutely cannot be with this. And it was people like you that said, just suit up and show up. Because you may be the only big book anybody reads. <clears throat> My son has not hurt himself in ten years. But if you're sitting here tonight and you love someone, and you love someone who's in trouble, because, you see, I, I, I know because of a disease called alcoholism that people die from the disease of alcoholism and they never take a drink because I watched that happen. And if you're sitting here and there's somebody you love, I'm just asking you don't give up five minutes before your miracle. Because, you see, my son's 44 years old. And uh, I'm 63 and I've been sober 27 years. And I have been praying every day that my son would get some kind of help. And about 10 months ago, I could, we had, Kelly told me what was wrong with Russ 12 or 13 years ago. But I could not get Russ. I can't make a grown man go get help. I can't. But what <clears throat> I did is I just kept trying to be the very best example I can be. And, uh, I'd been telling Russ about this doctor at the City of Hope in Los Angeles. And uh, about and 10 months ago, my son came to me and he said, Mom, what's the name of that doctor? So if you're sitting here tonight, just don't leave five minutes before the miracle. And uh, Russ and Cheryl have two little girls. And you know, I'm a mother who abused my children. But because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am a fabulous grandma. Absolutely fabulous. And I love it. I lo there's nothing I love more than to walk in a room and my grandchildren just run up to me screaming, Grandma, Grandma. Uh, my children trust me with their children. They let me have their children for weeks at a time. <laughs> That's what you've done for me. 
The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, left to my own devices, I'll self-destruct. The very best I was able to do for me is to get me pronounced dead on arrival. But thanks to a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, you breathe life into me. And tonight, I'm the woman I always wanted to be. If you ask me if I got a lot of self-worth and a lot of self-esteem, no, I don't know. I don't wake up with that. But what I've learned here is, is if you want self-esteem, go do an esteemable act. If you want self-worth, go do something worthy. Because I've learned it's a program of action. If I'll just go do those things, I'll instantly start to feel better. I'm a woman who's been married to one man, one, for almost 24 years. And I've been faithful and true to one, one man. (laughs) And I could never do that. I'm a woman that's self-supporting through my own contribution. And I just got to quickly tell you this. I suited up and I showed up and I went to work. You taught me how to work. You taught me to go to work, stay at work, that employers (laughs) took so much, it meant a lot to them if you just showed up. (laughs) And so I, I learned to go to work. I learned to stay at work, and this past July, I got to retire. So there are really some fabulous advantages about being old, and that is I don't have to work anymore. And Dave and I have moved to Birch Bay, Washington, and we have a beautiful house that looks out over Birch Bay, which is just that flows into the Pacific Ocean, and we have a piece of paradise. Now, I don't know how you get from there to there. I don't know how you get from bankruptcy and nothing to a house in Birch Bay. I don't know how you do that. All I know is is that I live in heaven. God loves loving me. God loves giving me those gifts. God loves to give me. The book tells me that it's his pleasure to make me happy. A piece of paradise. Just because you told me to be self-supporting through my own contribution. And today, I get a little Social Security check every month, and I don't have to work anymore. Amazing. Amazing. The place I'd always felt like a failure was that as a mom. And a few years ago, my sons came to me and they said, Mom, you're the mom we always wanted you to be. And that's a great event that's come to pass. And then probably about six or seven years ago, James and Kelly came to Dave and I and they said, we've made a will. And they didn't have Maddie then. And they said, if anything happens to the boys, we want you and Dave. If that happens to us, we want you and Dave to take the boys. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous will do. I'm a mother who abused her children. And now my children are willing to leave their precious cargo with me. Great events will come to pass. My son James told me, he said, uh, Mom, you be sure and you tell everybody out there that I love you. God bless you. I love you too. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.